Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. So welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's podcast as we move around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager. And I'm Olivia Howarth and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we've made it as far as the gut. When we say gut, we are talking essentially about the digestive system, so the intestines and the stomach. And the anus is another episode entirely, so we're not going to talk about the anus today. I still can't say anus without slightly giggling like a child. (laughs) So I guess the first thing that kind of struck me when I was thinking about the gut is it's another one of those body parts where reference to it just slips into our everyday language. So I started off with thinking, I hate your guts, not you personally, Olivia, but Mm -hmm. the term. And then I started thinking, well, you don't have the guts. You don't have the guts to do it. Or that was a gutsy thing to do. She was gutted when this terrible thing happened. Or I have a gut feeling about something. Mm -hmm. These are very, you know, they're not sort of obscure Shakespearean references. They're very everyday words that we use quite a lot without even really thinking about it. Yeah, no guts, no glory. I think... My theory, anyway, is that they seem to be referring to the guts as this very core part of you. So the guts are who you really are, the sort of deepest part of you, right? I hate your guts means I fundamentally hate you at your very core being. I was sort of thinking of someone being gutsy as being brave and Mm. sort of overcoming any nervous feeling they had inside them. It is sort of interesting. And again, we've talked about this before when we've looked at other body parts that maybe now in the 21st century, if we're thinking about bravery, maybe we're thinking about the heart, maybe we're thinking about the brain. But historically, you know, the the liver and the intestines and the stomach were often the kind of seat of a lot of things historically. So if you're thinking about your bravery, your courage, often they are in a humoral sense based in your abdomen, in your intestines and in your in your guts more than they are in your heart. So we've shifted around our priority organs, maybe. (laughs) Probably quite a good example of this is hypochondria. Is that something that you've come across, Olivia, in a historical sense? I know that the term hypochondriasis is used to describe a state of disease with no real cause. I mean, absolutely. Originates from somewhere in your guts area. There's a lot of disease terms that have shifted a lot. So what people meant by something historically is not what people mean by it today. So cholera in the 18th century was a completely different disease from cholera today. It was not an infectious disease. Cholera, as we understand it, came to Europe in 1831. Historically, when we talk about cholera, that's a different disease. It's the same with colic, the same with dyspepsia. A lot of abdominal diseases or diseases of of the gut, the words have remained, but the meaning of the words has shifted. And hypochondria is one of those. And I particularly like hypochondria because it's shifted multiple times. So hypochondria back in times of Hippocrates, you know, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, is a physical disease that's associated, as you say, Olivia, with the abdominal organs or with the gut. So it's a digestive disease of the body, particularly. Again, going back to humoral theory, this part of the body is associated with the production of black bile. And so excessive black bile causes hypochondria. They also use the term hypochondriac melancholy, but it is a disease of the guts. And then it begins to shift. And in the sort of 1700s, hypochondria is more a nervous disease. 1700s is a period when they're very interested in nervous diseases. And some of the time, at least, hypochondria is diagnosed as literally the male equivalent of hysteria. So it's a disease of the nerves. And there's lots of theories about why hypochondria is talked about more and more in the 1700s. There's a book by a Aberdonian called George Cheney that's called The English Malady. So that's 
published in the early 1700s. And it's all about nervous diseases. And it particularly includes hypochondria. And there's this idea that it is an English disease. Now, it might sound because he's Scottish and he's writing about the English malady that he is critiquing the English. He's not. He moves to Bath, where all of the finest ladies and gentlemen go. And he is writing this book to sell to his very upper class English audience. So his idea is that this is a particularly English disease because the English elites are becoming more soft, I guess, more corrupt, more enfeebled. There's this rise of consumerism. They're eating too much. They're not getting enough exercise. They are degrading, I suppose. And that was a real fear, the degradation of the English, the weakness of the English. And hypochondria was part of that. I have a note here that the hypochondria, so like the part of you that was responsible for making you feel awful, was meant to be the seat of melancholy and the source of the vapour that caused morbid feelings. I guess it's complicated because what is mental, what is physical, what is real and what is not are all very mixed up. And you also do have this three-part transition where it's a physical thing in the gut, then it's a sort of neurological disease, then it's it's hypochondria in a 21st century sense. But it's obviously not three parts in a very simple, clear way. It moves between and back and forth and becomes all of these different things. And you get a lot of patent medicines. In the 1700s is kind of the rise of patent medicines in general. But there's various medicines specifically to treat hypochondria. So there's one called hypodrops, hypo being slang or, or shorthand for, for hypochondria. So you can buy your hypodrops. Hanging back to previous humoral theory ideas about balancing out what goes into and what comes out of your body, for a long time there was a concern about should you actually treat people's diarrhea? Because if somebody had diarrhea for years and years, even for decades, that it could actually be dangerous to stop it because your body had got used to this certain flow. So doctors would sometimes go, well, they've just got diarrhea now. This is just who they are. Because if I try and stop it, something else is going to come out of somewhere else that's going to be even worse because the body will balance itself. Just to go back to anatomy very briefly, I was looking at like, oh, what do they think the intestines were responsible for? Apparently, Leonardo da Vinci thought that the digestive system aided the respiratory system. And according to him, the stomach muscles contract, which caused elevation in the intestines, which then meant the diaphragm would thrust upwards because of the condensed air in the intestines, driving the air out of the lung. (laughs) He said the air which is in the intestines arises from the desiccation of feces, which gives off vapours. Well, they do love their (laughs) vapours. Sticking with intestines, one of the paths that my brain went down as part of this was looking at intestinal worms. I found one quote from a doctor that said they had found worms of seven or eight foot long, sometimes 19, 23, 30, 45 feet. Wow. There was a Swedish physician, Nils Rosenstein, who talked about treatments for intestinal worms. And one of his pieces of advice was to attach a piece of pork to a string, insert it into the anus, and then the worm will grab it and be pulled out. Don't try this at home, I guess, is what we we would say to that one. One of the medicinal intestines related treatments was ambergris. So we're not talking about human intestines. We are, of course, talking about intestines of the sperm whale. So ambergris has been used for more than 2000 years, but it's only really in the 1800s that people understood exactly what ambergris was, because that's when there was sort of large scale whaling. And that's when people found ambergris actually inside sperm whales because normally it was found washed up on a beach or floating in the sea and people realised that it was actually from the inside of a sperm whale. So basically how it works is sperm whales eat a lot of things like squid and cuttlefish and obviously lots of parts of those things can be easily digested but some parts are indigestible and those move into the sperm whale's intestines, they bind together and over literally years they become a solid mass that is ambergris. It's quite rare, so you couldn't hunt sperm whales for ambergris, because odds are if you opened up a sperm whale, only I think 5% of sperm whales actually have ambergris inside them, but it has lots of historical medical uses. So it's most known for its use in perfume, but medically it'd be used as an aphrodisiac. It was used to protect from plague and lots of other infectious diseases. Again, I'm not arguing for the efficacy of this. I'm just saying what people did, but the most common way 
as far as I can understand it, that you would find it. Particularly in continental Europe and particularly in France, there were things called pomanders, which were made to hold ambergris. So a pomander, in the way that I'm talking about it, it's an open work metal container and you would put the ambergris inside it. And the idea was that the sort of scent of the ambergris would somehow protect you from infectious diseases. What it made me think of was when I was a young child, where we would make pomanders out of oranges and cloves. You are nodding your head. So this is not just a dream that I had. And they apparently had a similar sort of idea originally. If you were poor and you couldn't afford one of these very, very rare and expensive items, you would make an orange and cloves, sometimes involving herbs and things like that. You would tie it with ribbon. And in theory, that would also protect you from noxious smells. And things. But you did that as a child then, Olivia. Yeah. Or little oranges with cloves on the outside. You tie a ribbon around it and they carry it around. It's it's like homemade potpourri. Yes. I mean, it's a very romantic name as well, Ambergris. Makes yes. it sound very fancy. I wonder how you would have felt, you know, because it's been used for thousands of years in, in Greece and Rome, in, in Egypt, in China. There were all sorts of romantic ideas about what Ambergris was. Then to discover that it is pooed out buy a sperm whale. I wonder if you just went, oh, I don't want this necklace anymore (laughs) now that I know. So I was looking for things to do with intestines and I came across the phrase iliac passion, which again, another romantic word. What it actually means is something horrible. It's where you have symptoms like abdominal cramps, abdominal distension, vomiting and an inability to go to the toilet. So King Stephen of England died of iliac passion in 1154. And there was a physician called Thomas Sydenham in 1686 who recommended first bleeding someone who had iliac passion. And then if that didn't work or following that, it's it's our good old friend Dutch fumigation. Tobacco smoke enema. Probably makes more sense than the bleeding. Do you know where the name comes from? I tried my best. No. The iliac parts to do with the intestines. So you have an ileostomy now. I think iliac passion, the modern equivalent is ileus. If someone can't produce anything from their bowels and it's all coming up instead, that's called an ileus. The passion part, not so sure. I'm guessing maybe it's to do with the violence of what's happening. Mm. But I thought that was interesting as a, as a term. Sounds sort of interesting actually pretty horrible. If you said the term and just asked me to guess what it meant, I don't think that's where my mind would have gone, (laughs) I have to say. I have one more thing, and it's not a particularly useful bit of information, but it's that kind of pub quiz knowledge that you might eventually find a use for. The duodenum, the C-shaped segment of this small intestine, is called the duodenum because a Greek doctor in the 4th century BCE claimed it was 12 fingers long. Geodenum translates to 12 fingers. Okay. Was he right? I'm not sure. I also don't know if it's fingers as in a finger length or fingers as in finger width, the way that you would measure a hand. I'm not <laughs> holding my hands up. Yeah, um, it's, it's not a visual medium. <laughs> In our case study today, we're going to look at one particularly remarkable way of displaying the guts, the medical venus. Also known as the anatomical venus, the slashed beauties and the dissected graces. These were wax anatomical models created in a workshop in Florence in the 1700s. They were created to be displayed in the Spicola Museum, one of the first public science museums in the world. The museum and its contents were funded by the Duke of Tuscany. The official aim was to educate the public on human anatomy while avoiding the indignity of displaying actual human remains. Some of the models on display were individual body parts, legs, arms, torsos. All were modelled from actual human remains, sourced from a hospital morgue, combined with reference illustrations from famous anatomical works by Albinus and Vesalius. There were full-size models of both men and women. The women were rather different from the men, however. The male models were usually displayed completely skinned to show their musculature. The women, by contrast, usually had their skin intact, although with sections which could be removed to show the organs within. And the men were usually shown standing or seated, while all the female figures were displayed lying down. And this is what makes the Venuses particularly unsettling. 
They have perfect skin, human hair. Some have pearl necklaces, tiaras or ribbons. They are posed in almost sensual ways, except they are ripped open from their neck to their navel, with their guts hanging out. But a real effort has been made not to just make them educational, but beautiful. Perhaps this was done to make them more palatable to their non-medical audiences. Perhaps it was influenced by contemporary artists such as Leonardo da Vinci. It certainly made them controversial, and there was debate about exactly how useful these anatomical models would be to budding doctors, given their stylized nature. But these models made sense in a period of rising public interest in science, and public displays of experiments and discoveries at town halls and galleries across Europe. Added to this, the ability for medical students to access corpses for dissection was simpler in northern Europe, where colder temperatures and less humidity slowed decomposition. But in Italy, Greece, Spain and the like, this was much more difficult, and so substitutes like the wax Venus were more valuable. The Venus was not the first anatomical wax figure. Others had been made in the early 1700s, but it was the most detailed and certainly the most lifelike. And it was the Venus that subsequent modellers across Europe copied to make their own wax women for display and education. In this short excerpt, Dr. James Kennaway explores the fashionable nature of Georgian diseases of the gut. With um, stomach complaints, every, even every few years, and throughout the Georgian period, there was a new diagnosis that would come along. You have a, essentially a medical marketplace in many ways, so you have doctors in, inventing new terms and trying to redefine everything in the context of their own diagnosis. Um, of course, especially towards the end of the Georgian period, you start to get um, the influence of Paris medicine and local pathology and a much more detailed understanding of the um, digestive system. And that's the time, for example, when the word hypochondria starts to take on its modern meaning um, of, so to speak, an imaginary illness. Um, but for most of the period I'm talking about here, hypochondria was still understood as uh, essentially a, um, a disease of the bowels that would affect the mind in all sorts of ways. Uh, because of these constantly shifting um, diagnoses and because of the associations with the elite, there's always a debate going on at the same time about whether these conditions in general are fake or imaginary, just like there is now a lot of skepticism. And that's often related to a broader critique of the social elite, especially a middle-class critique of aristocratic vice. That is to say that, you know, um, the conditions which certain people might like to associate with themselves because of their links to wealth and power and um, style, other people see as a, an example of, of cultural decay. Uh, and in terms of uh, digestion, um, one of my main arguments is really that digestion is, I would say, the, at the very center of this debate on um, fashionable disease, at least as common as gout, uh, at least as common as nerves in its own right. The stomach is directly related to all those other fashionable diseases, almost all of them. Um, gout, there's the flying gout, and it was regarded as the most dangerous when flying gout reached the stomach. It would fly around your body, and if it got to the stomach, lots of people, even, even lay observers, would say, well, I have the flying gout, but luckily it hasn't reached my stomach. Uh, the relationship between eating and gout was understood in all sorts of ways in general, and it's certainly true. Um, the link to the mind, I would say, though, is extremely important. That's one of the main things that we're talking about today. The, associate, the link between um, st stomach complaints and emotional and mental states made it very easy to link those um, um, emotional and mental states with moral causes, emotions, and all sorts of personal vices, being incredibly intelligent, for example. Uh, thinking too hard, you know, what effect does that have on the stomach? Being especially sensitive and so forth. Being just um, a wicked person, what effect does that have? Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Recipes for problems in the guts or intestinal tract were many and varied. The recipe book Taylor's Ready Doctor, published in 1785, contained recipes for affections of the guts, which included, quote, 
hen's dung drunk in wine, the ankle bone of a hare hung or bound around the belly, a live duck's belly applied to the pain, a live frog applied to the belly, draweth all the evil to itself and dieth, rotten dung that is found in stables where they piss much, parched and dried, fried with oil and applied, dove's dung bruised and boiled, man's dung, mouse dung, goat's dung, hen's dung applied, hath been found profitable to many. Make a bath presently, in which put all sorts of dung that may be had or gotten. Which does all sound pretty unpleasant, but it does end on a more positive note with garlic with a little bread eaten. For sore guts, quote, take a glass of good rum, gin or brandy. If you do not choose to take any of these, drink a bowl. Um, now it does say bowel here, but I'm pretty sure it means bowl. Full of sweet milk and a little pepper, eased by admission of the cold air by ventilation, by smearing the face over with a water sponge dipped in water and vinegar, cold, by eating of gooseberries, brambleberries, or with the juice of licorice, or juice of oranges, or lemons, or citrons. For a sore belly, quote, fresh cherries, prunes, apples, figs taken in meat, broth of beets, of mallows, raisins eaten before dinner, juice of mercury, anoint the orifice of the fundament with aloes, bacon bruised mixed with ink applied to the belly, a miraculous and most expert remedy. Fill the bone of a dead man's arm or leg with his dung, whom you have in mind to purge. Close it strongly and well with wax, and being bound with a cord, cast it into hot scalding water, so long as it remaineth therein, whose dung it was shall be loosed, and this bone taken out again shall cease running." And if you want to know more about the use of human bones in medical recipes, check out our podcast episode on the skull. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you. <laughs>